We're going to jump into the text this morning. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 8. And if you have your Bible and want to turn there, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, if you're newer or first time in a first long time or something around here, then um, we're in the middle of a series we started back in August. And if you've been tracking with us for a little while, you've heard the exact same introduction for a long time. Uh, that is on purpose, but this is a discipleship series that we're in. And uh, it's called Foundations, and we're talking about how to build or rebuild your life with Jesus at the center of it all. We think that over the past couple of years, there have been a lot of cracks in our foundations that have been exposed, and all the trials and in all the difficulties that we've been facing. And it's revealed, hey, you know what? There's some work to be done as we build our lives with Jesus at the center of it all. And so where do we begin? What foundation do we lay? And so we are talking very specifically about 30 beliefs, practices, and virtues, 10 of each, beliefs, practices, and virtues that are going to help us know God really, really well, do what he calls us to do, and be who he's called us to be. These are the priorities and the call of a disciple of Jesus Christ, that we would know him well, do the things he's called us to do, and then be like him in absolutely everything. And so last semester, we talked a lot about the practices uh, that are going to put us in a position to know him well, uh, to do what he's called us to do. And this semester, we're jumping into some of the priority beliefs that we can hold. And so one of the things we're saying about beliefs, uh, they're not the proof of knowing him well. They're simply the beginning, right? I, you can check off all the right things. You can have all the right beliefs, not proofs of knowing him well. They are the beginning place. And so this week, I want to jump into a new one. We've talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the first three weeks. Uh, we talked about the authority and the beauty, the inspiration and errancy of God's Word, why we can trust it last week, two weeks ago, I guess it was. And uh, this week, I want to talk a little bit more about us, okay? A little bit about humanity and mankind and how you and I can think well about us, individually, corporately, humankind, mankind, and things like that. In light of all of humanity's complexity, in light of our propensity to do incredible amounts of evil and incredible amounts of good, how in the world do you and I think well about ourselves and about humanity? Why do we care about children who are hungry in third world countries far away? Like, why do we care about reconciling families with previous inmates when they come home? Why do we care about feeding the hungry in our own neighborhood and helping families that are in need that may not even come to Dallas Bible Church or we may not have any prior relationship with whatsoever? I mean, if Richard Dawkins is correct, then you and I are simply machines that pass on our DNA from one person to the next, right? So, so why do we care if someone over in Tanzania is able to successfully pass on their DNA from one generation to the next? Is it simply because, hey, they may create a child that one day rises up and is able to cure cancer one time? Like, is, that, is, is it about what they can bring to the table and what value they can bring to me personally or generations to come in the future? Is that really what it's about? Let me bring the question on home a little bit more specifically to you. What is it that you cling to about yourself that convinces you that you actually matter? Like, what is that thing that you look at, the thing you cling to, the thing that you, that ruminates in your mind before you go to bed? Is it your ability to protect and provide for your family? Is that the thing that you cling to that says, okay, this is the thing that gives me value, dignity, and honor? Is it your ability to make babies? And lots of them. And good ones at that. That are smart and well-behaved and whatever it may be. Right? Is it your ability to climb the ladder or to make a really fat paycheck every single month? Is it your ability to do really awesome things that other people think are also awesome? Is it your ability to have tons of followers on social media and things like that? Is it your ability to do really, really cool things? What about the elderly? Do they have value when you get to a point when you're physically not able to do the things that you used to do in your youth? Or you're not able to think with as much clarity as you used to think back in the day? When you're not able to accomplish the things that you used to at some point in time. What about infants and young children who aren't able to bring much to the table at all? Do they have value and where does their value come from? Um, Peter Singer, who's a tenured professor of bioethics at Princeton, he argues that a newborn baby isn't very valuable at all. And he actually writes this. He says, human babies are born, he says, human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. Therefore, they're not people. But animals are self-aware. And therefore, the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. 
By the way, like not making that up, that's not like inflammatory, Snopes it out and it didn't really exist kind of a thing. Like, like the tenured professor from his book, Practical Ethics, Bioethics Professor at Princeton University. Like not the dude that's like spouting off YouTube videos from a gas station in Florida, right? Like, like, like not that guy. Like higher education learning from his book right here. He continues and he says this. He says, furthermore, if you compare a severely defective human infant with a non-human animal, you'll often find that the animal has superior capacities. Only the fact that the defective infant is a member of the species Homo sapien leads it to be treated different from the animal. But species membership alone is not morally re- relevant. What do you think about that one, church? Like, is it relevant that you and I are human beings? Is there any distinction between us and the squirrels? Right? Like, is, there anything, is there anything valuable there? I mean, Peter Singer goes on and he argues, and he says, if you actually think that there's something special about being a homo sapien, it makes you a speciesist, which is like a sexist or a racist or something like that, something you don't want to be, right? He continues in his argument and he says, he says, my colleague Helga, she should be allowed a period of 28 days after birth to determine whether or not an infant has the same right to live as other people. Church, where does our human dignity come from? Do we have dignity value, and honor, apart from the things that we do. This is what I want to jump into here in our text. Psalm chapter 8, again, is where we're going to be. Uh, If you're not familiar with the Psalms at all, the Psalms are essentially a songbook for the nation of Israel. uh, It's a gathering of of, of poems and songs and wisdom literature even at different times, largely written by King David over different points of his life. But this is what's going on here in chapter chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. And so it begins like this. It says, to the choir master, according to the giddeth, which is a strained instrument that we don't really know a whole lot about, but um, that's kind of how they play it. And so it's kind of instructions for how to play this song. This is a song, a psalm of David, he says. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How many of you guys remember this song from the 80s? O oh, Lord, our oh, Lord, Michael W. Smith. Yeah, Sandy Patty probably made it famous. Uh, she did something with it anyway. But it's like, you know, O oh, Lord, our oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Prince of peace, mighty God, O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord, O oh, my. Yeah, awesome. Drew, that'll be next week for you, man. Um, I'll bring that one up there. Uh, this is what the psalmist is doing right here. It's a song. It, 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 it's, a, it's a song of exuberation. It's a song where he's singing about the majesty of God's name. And what he's saying about that name is that it's one of these names that resonates everywhere. It's one of these names you're not going to forget. It's one of these names that, hey, like, it's out there and you're never going to forget it. Kind of like my, my brother dated a girl early on in, in the early days. and Her name was Anita Knapp. Not kidding, like, like Anita Knapp. It was awesome, right? Like I don't know any of his friends. I couldn't tell you any of his friends' names to this day. Like I never forgot the name Anita Knapp. It's one of those names that resonates through decades, through centuries, you never, ever, ever forget that name. Well, my brother had a kid in one of his classrooms. It was, uh, he's going through the roster, and it was A, B, C, D, E. And he comes to me, and he's like, what, A, B, C? Like, he's like, no, 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 Apsity. Apsity is how it's pronounced right there. And that's just how the whole thing was pronounced. But it's one of these names that, that he's saying, it's kind of like, it resonates everywhere. You're not going to forget this name, because there's a story that's associated with this name that makes you never forget the reality of this name. Uh, we know this, like all good names, they have a story associated with the name, right? You could probably even look at your own name and be like, oh, okay, yeah, this is why my parents named me Amanda. Like there's somebody in my family named Amanda. They knew somebody named Amanda. It was an awesome name. And so uh, like there's a story associated with my name. Uh, when we were naming Caleb, when Caleb was born, I wanted to name him Caleb Asher because I love the stories uh, that are aligned with those people in the scriptures. Caleb was a man that believed God when no one else around him believed God. And not only that, but he had the courage to stand up for what he believed when no one else had the courage to be able to do so. And we prayed for that all the time. I was like, Lord, give him courage. Give him a faith and a confidence in you that allows him to stand out and walk with you no matter what other people are doing. Asher is the eighth son of Jacob. It literally, in Hebrew, it means blessed or happy. And we always pray that, God, would your blessing be on his life? Would he know the joy of walking with you all the days of his life? There's a story associated with his name. And this is what all great names do. They have a, a story associated with their name. Uh, it's why there's uh, not a whole lot of like Judases uh, or Jezebels or Adolfs around today, right? It's not that there's anything inherently wrong with the name. It's just that someone a really long time ago ruined it for the rest of us. Like, there's a terrible story associated with that name. And so the psalmist begins this way. 
And he begins by singing, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And just like all great names that we've been talking about, his name, Lord's name, tells an incredible story that also speaks to our value. And so I want you to notice this here at the beginning of the psalm. He begins with two different names for God. O Lord, our Lord, O Lord, in all caps, Yahweh, the personal covenant name of God that speaks of his holiness, this name that early Jews, they wouldn't even say out loud because it was so holy, the personal covenant name of God, Lord, in all caps right there. It's a name that reminds us that that holy God saw fit to draw near to us and to be in covenant relationship with us. And he made a covenant with our forefathers, Abraham. O Lord, all caps right there, our Lord, Adonai is the second word right there, uh, meaning mighty Lord, right? The one who is in authority. Our, our master is the name of that, that is, is the definition of that name. The one who's in charge. And so this is uh, the story of his name. You put it all together and the story of his name is something like this. The one who is in charge of us all has chosen to be in relationship with me. The one who is in charge of it all has chosen to be in relationship with me. The one who's made it all, like the one who has got all glory, all power, all might, has chosen to be in relationship with me. And this is what he's singing about. Oh, Yahweh, oh, Adonai. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name that the God of all might has drawn near to me in mercy and chosen to be in relationship with me. How majestic is your name, he sings. You've set your glory above the heavens, is what he says here in this psalm. He continues in verse 2 and he says, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. In other words, this is who you are. This is what you've done. You, you silence the one who wants to take us out. In your might, in your power, you, you steal the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And not only that, but you do it from the mouth of babies and infants. I love this part of the psalm. I hope you don't miss this part of the psalm. Like, not only do you silence the enemy, but you don't use weapons of mouth destruction. You, you, you do it with the mouth of babies and infants, like this is what he's talking about. Like, like when God goes toe-to-toe with the enemy, he chooses a team of babies to partner with. Like, can you think about what he's talking about here? He's going toe-to-toe with the enemy. I want a team of babies, and he wins that way, right? Like, he goes, like when he's playing kickball with his friends on the playground, like he finds the kid that's typically picked last, and he's like, I want you. I want you on my team. And I want a whole team of people just like you, and we're going to win this thing. This is what he's talking about here in this psalm. Like that there's a terrifying enemy and there's a God and there's a whole team of babies. Like church, like what are the babies going to do? How do they silence the enemy? Like what do they like, cry all night long and make them really, really tired? Like what are they going to do? Like spit up? A dirty diaper or something like that? Like it's the whole point of the psalm. Like a baby can't do anything. They can't, they can't keep themselves alive. They can't protect themselves. They can't communicate. They can't change themselves. They can't provide. Like what can a baby do? And it's the whole point of this psalm that a baby is completely dependent on, parent, on a parent for everything. And this is what the psalmist is singing about. He's simply going to, that even in my weakness, even in my depravity, even in my rebellion against you, even in, in all these different kinds of things that I can't do for myself, even when I've got nothing to offer you, you still chose me. You still chose to team up with me. Oh God, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And not only did you choose me, but you chose to use me in your work of silencing the enemy. Like how in the world is that possible? You still choose to use a baby like me in my weakness and my depravity, my wandering and my frailty. You still choose to use me for your kingdom purposes? Are you kidding me? Well, I mean, this is the testimony of what God does with us all throughout scripture. Judges chapter seven, God tells Gideon to reduce the size of his army. Remember this one? He's got an army, 32,000 large going against the enemy, pretty awesome size army. And God's like, you know what? It's a little too big. We're gonna need you to reduce it down to 10,000. And so Gideon's like, well, okay, all right. And he does it, and he gets down to 10,000, and God's like, yeah, a little too big still. I'm going to need to reduce down to 300, and Gideon's kind of going, okay, God, are you crazy? Are you crazy? Like, why in the world would you do this? And you remember what God says? He says, I didn't want Israel to boast, saying my own hand was able to save me. I didn't want Israel to boast, saying like my own hand 
is able to save me. In other words, God wanted to communicate to them and to us today that God is a God who is fighting for us, and he's the one who's going to provide on our behalf. We are the baby. He is the parent taking care of us. It's a narrative all throughout Scripture, 2 Kings chapter 5. God uses a little servant girl from Israel to humble and to bring healing to Naaman, who's the commander of the Syrian army, right? Enemies at war right there. They've taken captive Israelite slave girl right there. And God uses a small little slave girl right there to bring healing physically and spiritually to the Syrian commander in chief. I, the unbelievable paradox right there. This is what he does. Samaritan woman at the well, overlooked, ashamed, despised by most people. Jesus goes to her, has a conversation. She becomes the first evangelist in the New Testament, right? Mary Magdalene, right? Seven different demons. And guess what? She sees the resurrected Christ and she's the one that's the first um, herald of the resurrected Christ. Like this is what he does. He makes weak people strong and through the mouths of babies and infants, he silences the enemy. And so the psalmist is, David simply looking at this kind of going like, you did all that with me. The unbelievable value that you would see someone like me and that you would use me like a baby, a mouth that, that can't do much of anything good, and you would choose to use me to bring about your purposes and silencing the enemy. And he just marvels at it. And he continues on and he's like, why in the world would a God that mighty and strong care about me? Verse 3. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place. In other words, he's like out there and he's looking at the stars and it's a beautiful night. There's no lights around and he's just looking and he's gazing in the middle of a field. And he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you would care for him? And in other words, like who in the world am I that you would care about me? This is, have you ever asked that question before? Yeah, all the time. Like I do that all the time. I'm sitting there like, who in the world that, Am I? Like, what if I, like, why in the world would you care about me? This is David. He's looking at the entirety of God's creation out in the middle of a field, as I can imagine, as a young shepherd, tending to the sheep, no one else around him. Like, I can only imagine how close the stars may have been that night, like, counting them by the billions probably that night, looking at all, the entirety of what God has created, going, like, who in the world that you would care, who, am, who in the world am I that you would care about me? This is the question that he's asking. And Neil Armstrong used to talk about how small he felt every time he looked at the stars in the sky. And I love that Neil Armstrong, I think he's the authority on this one, uh, he described it like this in one of his books. But he said, I remember on the way home on Apollo 11, um, my journal entries are very different than his, right? Okay. I was like, yeah, I don't really start my journal entries like that. Um, I remember on the way home on Apollo 11, we suddenly came to the tiny, pretty, and blue earth. I put my thumb up. And I shut one eye, and my thumb blotted out the entire earth. But he goes, I didn't feel like a giant. I felt really, really small. Because I'd been in the rest of the universe, and I'd seen everything else God had created. And it made me feel small. Like, this is what the psalmist is going to like. He's aware of how small he is. And, and scientists acknowledge this, right? Like, the more they discover about the universe, like we, the more we discover how small we are in light of everything that God has created, and in light of that must make, how big that must make God, right, in, in light of all these things. They talk about how there's uh, over 500 solar systems, 300 billion stars in the Milky Way, Milky Way galaxy alone. It's kind of a lot. The sun is 93 million miles away from us, a million times the size of the earth, <laughs> a million times. Like the, the observable universe, there's over 100 billion galaxies beyond the Milky Way. Right, just an absurd enormity right here. And what's fascinating is that to a lot of people today, they're looking at the enormity of the universe and how big everything else, and they're, and they're kind of going, okay, well, that's, that's reason not to believe in this narrative that we read in Scripture. Like the enormity of the universe is reason enough not to believe that God actually thinks big of you or anything like that. And so here's how the argument kind of plays out. Well, Scriptures were written a really, really long time ago by a people that thought that the earth was flat. And they also thought that the sun and the moon and the stars and everything else in the universe, it revolved around the earth. And so, of course, they're going to think that little old me is, we're the center of humanity, we're the center of the universe. And so, of course, they're going to think that God thinks I'm sort of valuable or honorable or I have integrity or something like that. Of course, they're going to think big of, of that. However, now because of science, we can clearly see that the universe is really, really big. Mankind is really, really small. The earth is really small. And so it would be really silly to believe in a God that thinks you're kind of a big deal. And so the funny part about that argument is that they're making an assumption that the Bible never really makes. 
This idea that our human dignity, our value, our honor has anything to do with our size and capacity. It's not an argument that the scriptures make about us. Like David's not looking at the enormity of the, the sun, moon, and the stars being like, man, look how awesome I am. Like he's not, he's not gazing at all those things and going like, hey, God, did you, like, did you see my, like, what I did with that, that, that uh, you know, the slingshot the other day? <laughs> like, did you see what I did to that lion out in the fields? That, that was pretty incredible. You've seen these abs lately? Like six minutes. This is all it takes. Like, it's pretty incredible. Like he's not sitting there boasting about anything that's going on there. He's sitting there going, he's looking at the heavens and he's going, I'm tiny and I'm small in light of how big you are. And yet I still know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love me and that you still care about me. Why in the world would you care about little old me? It's a given that this God who created all that still for one reason or another still cares about little old me. What is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you would care for him. It doesn't make any sense. And yet here it is, verse 5. You've made him just a little bit lower than the heavenly beings. And you've crowned him with glory and honor. In other words, he's, he's marveling at the fact that like we did nothing to earn this dignity, value, and honor. He's just want, he's worshiping in light of that reality. Like we didn't have to do anything to get it. He simply gave it to us. And he chose to crown us with glory and honor. Here's why. Just because. Just because. And to the performance-minded, rewards-driven world that we live in today, like that's never going to make any sense. It's never going to be seen as a good thing. That's why years ago, many in the press were blaming Mr. Rogers for ruining an entire generation of kids. I don't know if you remember reading some of these headlines or anything like that, but they claimed that he ruined an entire generation of kids. One news outlet ran it. They called him an evil, evil man. You want to know why? It's because he told kids that they were valuable and he didn't make them earn their value. He said you're valuable simply because you are. In terms of like, it's never going to make sense to people who've only known one way over the other. To people who've grown up in homes where your value is tied only to the things that you do or you accomplish or the value that you bring to me personally, the things that bring me joy. And so I love the way that Ben Stiller tries to, Ben Stiller, Ben Stewart, very different people. Um, that was awesome. Yeah, Ben Stiller did not say this one. Ben Stewart did though. Um, he's trying to wrap his mind around like how this could possibly be. And he tries to explain it like this. He says, common things often become uncommon or in their, when they're aligned with someone great. Common things often become uncommon when they're aligned with someone great. There's a great example of this he used. It was from a number of years back. I shared it a few years ago, but uh, um, someone posted this on eBay. Uh, someone was selling a, bear of, a, a bag of air in a Ziploc bag from a Kanye West concert. Like, that's what that is. That is a Ziploc bag of air from a Kanye West concert. And I don't know if you can see the bid. The bid got up to $60,100. 60000 Like, is there anything special about that air? Like, I guarantee, like, I hope you say no, right? And I hope none of you bought that either, right? Um, like, there's nothing special about that bag of air. The only thing special about that is that it's associated with someone who's perceived to be great, right? Like, this is the whole thing. Like, common things often become uncommon when they're associated with someone great. It's the same thing with baseball cards. I don't know how many of you guys collected baseball cards or sports cards or something like that. Like, that was a huge hobby of mine growing up. I loved them. I collected them like crazy. Uh, true story in high school, I sold a bunch of them. I was able to buy tires for my Jeep, and that was pretty awesome. And, um, but I loved selling baseball cards and collecting them and things like that. There's nothing special about the card. Uh, did you know that the most valuable baseball card uh, in history is a 1909 to 1911 T206 Honus Wagner card? I think I got a picture of it up here. I don't know if you guys have seen this one. You want to know how much it sold for? Uh, I think it was about four or five years ago. Uh, $3.12 million that little card on the left was worth. Uh, today, the estimated value is $7.5 million. 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle card sold for $1.13 million, worth somewhere around $2.5 to $3 million today. 1915 Babe Ruth rookie card, you can see it right there, sold for $717,000, worth somewhere around $1.5 million today. Church, like, is there anything special about that cardboard? Like, those things aren't made of gold. Like, it's not like diamond encrusted or anything like that. Like, there's nothing special about that card except for the fact that it's associated with someone who's great. And that's it. 
It's why we come back and we remind you over and over and over again what Genesis tells us, and this is true in the very beginning, that you and I, every man, woman, and child has been created in the image of God. All that's unique about that car is that it bears the image of someone who's great. And so he makes it clear to us, Genesis 1.26, all of humanity, man, woman, and child, rich, poor, no matter where you're born, what time in history, every single person on this planet, inherit dignity, value, and honor as image bearers of God. This is where dignity comes from. It is conferred dignity given to us by God simply because we didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to deserve it, which also means you can't do anything to give it away. It's simply because we are associated with a king who has chosen to crown us with glory and honor and dignity and value. And before we start thinking to ourselves, okay, well, great. Well, that's going to produce a really, really lazy and entitled generation. Like he continues, like, like, like that gift, he continues to talk about how that gift is not without responsibility. He says in verse 6, you've given him dominion over the work of your hands. In other words, in light of all of that conferred dignity, he still acknowledges verse 6, you've given him, meaning mankind, man and woman, male and female, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things underneath his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. In other words, both men and women, women, male and female, have both been given a responsibility to steward his creation well. This is what he's called us to do. I've created everything else in the world. I've created mankind in my image. I've given mankind a responsibility to go and to be stewards of my creation really, really well. Genesis 1.26 says the exact same thing. It's what the psalmist is quoting here in this text. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. But I want you to notice what comes first. They're made in the image of God, dignity and value first, and then comes the responsibility. It's not, hey, go do this, and then we'll see if you've got value. It's, no, 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 you've been given dignity and value first as an image bearer of God. Now go and steward my creation well. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 2, 10, when he says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of doing good works. In other words, he didn't just create us to work. He created us to go and to do Good works, as he's defined what's good. The, the great commission that we go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching people to deserve everything that he's commanded us to do. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, it's the first time we're told not to kill people. You want to know why? Because people are made in the image of God and given inherent dignity and value, and he loves them and he sees them in a very different way. James 3, 9, we're not even supposed to curse people out. We don't even curse them. In other words, like, we don't even say bad things about them. We don't even wish terrible things upon them. Like, even if they're, like, even on 635, right? Like, like, even in those things. Like, even if they're acting like a fool and they really, really deserve it. Like, we, just, we still don't even curse them in those, in those situations. Micah 6, 8, it's when the prophet asked the Lord. And he says, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do here? I can tell that we're not on good terms and we've kind of rebelled. You're really unhappy and things are going really poorly. What would you have us do? And you remember what he says? Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with the Lord. You want to know what to do? That's it. Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with the Lord. That's what you've forgotten all of these years. You've forgotten how to do what's right in relationship with one another. You've forgotten what it is to have mercy and to give mercy to other people who don't deserve your mercy. It's the nature and the definition of mercy. They don't deserve it. It's why you have to give it. Walk humbly with the Lord. In other words, what he's telling them is you've forgotten how to reflect the God whose image you bear. And so this is what God's done for us. In his majesty and in his might, the one who is in charge of it all, Adonai, In his mercy, he has chosen to crown us with dignity and honor, irregardless of our capacity. And he, meaning Yahweh, our God, has chosen to be in relationship with me. And he calls us to go and to do the exact same thing, to see, to love, and to care for the small and the weak, and everything in between. A little while ago, Time Magazine came out with an article, and it was titled this. It was a shocking title. Why Down Syndrome is on the Decline. It talked about how new prenatal blood tests can inform pregnant women as early as 10 weeks 
that their fetus may now have Down syndrome. In other words, the article describes that the reason Down syndrome is on the decline today, it's not because we found a cure or anything like that. It's because doctors are now detecting it early on in the womb, and they're asking parents if they want to terminate the pregnancy. And the reality is that more and more people are saying yes. I remember talking with a couple a few years back about that option. They went through it, and this is their story. And they wept when that option was presented to them. And they screamed at the doctor, and they're like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, this is my child. This is my child, the one we've been praying for, longing for forever. Of, no, that's not even a choice. And we're having this conversation years down the road, and he just goes off. And if you've ever known anybody with Downs, like, you know the joy, you know the happiness, you know the unique perspective that they bring that is so incredible. Like, you've never experienced anything like it. They just went off and they just wept, and they're like, of course, this is our child. How, we would never think about that. Are you kidding me? Inherent dignity, value, and honor simply on the basis of being made in the image of God. This is our baby. Anyone who's known or loved or anybody that's had disabilities or anything like that, like you know what we're talking about in this thing. It doesn't matter how difficult it may be or what the challenges may be. You know that there's value, that there's love, that there's honor, there's dignity, there's respect. I told you many of the stories about my own cousin Kimberly, 30 years of difficulty, not being able to walk or talk or control herself or anything like that unbelievable faith, unbelievable joy, love and affection like I've never seen in another human being, unbelievable value, dignity, and respect. But here's what the psalmist is saying right here. Even if she didn't bring all of that, she would still have the same dignity, value, and respect being made in the image of God. Even if she never brought a moment of joy to my particular point, time, personhood, to who I am, my being, she would still have the exact same dignity, value, and respect. And it's exactly what the psalmist is talking about right here, church. Like, this is why we care about the unborn. This is why we care about infants and children. It's why we care about the elderly. Even if they're not having the same capacities that they once had, or if it requires something of us to care for them in their old age. It's why we care about the marginalized and the weak. It's why we care about when Men, especially women, are overwhelmingly abused. It is an attack on the, on the image of God in somebody else's life. It's why we care about these things, the pain. It's why we care about them whether we know them or not know them, whether they've added personal joy or value in my particular life or not. It's why we care about these things. It's why we care about racial injustice. It's not a tertiary issue or something out there. No, no, no. This is central to how he's called us to interact and to love and to be in relationship with other people, men, women, and children made in the image of God. It's why we care about the homeless and we, we talk to them and we, we invest in ministries that are caring for them holistically in a helpful way. Not in an enabling way, but in a helpful way. And we look at them in the eyes and we give those human beings dignity and value. It's why we care about the immigrant. We teach them, we feed them, we help take care of children. We care about the refugee. We help them acclimate here to Dallas when they have no idea how to do life here in Dallas. And I thought about this one too, and I think this is worth mentioning. It's why we care about the powerful and the greedy too, right? And, and, and I say that one because it's the opposite of kind of what we're talking about right here. But there seems to be a movement somewhat culturally around here where you're like, okay, um, it's justified for me to bring down the powerful and the greedy because they're deserving of my dishonor. And that option isn't given to us in Scripture because what he's saying is apart from what we do, there is an inherent base level dignity, value, honor, and respect that goes to all of humanity since all of humanity, irregardless of what we've done, are made in the image of God. And so the psalmist is simply looking at this and he's marveling at that. And he's going, none of this makes any sense that you who created all that would care about me and my brokenness and my frailty through the mouths of infants and babies, you would silence the enemy. You would choose to do your work. You would choose to partner and team up and give me dignity. And value. None of that makes any sense. And so he wraps up this whole psalm by really singing the same way that he began. And he says in verse nine, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. And I hope you can picture the psalmist in all of his just... I don't know if you've ever had that time where you've just been overwhelmed at a sense of the goodness of God. This is where he is. 
O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. He's just worshiping. Because quite honestly, it's, it's not often that we see greatness reach down with mercy. It's not often that you see someone who's all powerful come down to the little, to the babies, to the infants, to the weak, and to the overlooked with mercy and an extension of dignity, value, and respect. It's not often that you see that kind of thing take place. That's why we see celebrities do that. Like, we make a big deal about it. I mean, Johnny Depp used to do this a little while ago. I don't know if you've seen these pictures and stuff, but he was famous for randomly showing up in children's hospitals dressed up as Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, you remember this? He, he would go in there, and he'd just show up in little kids' hospital rooms, and he would cheer them up, and they would laugh, and they'd be so happy. And we read those articles, and you're like, that's incredible. The Johnny Depp, someone as powerful and awesome as Johnny Depp and all of his acting brilliance, right? Like, uh, like if someone as awesome as that would come and do that, that he would make time for children in a hospital. Like, and we marvel at that because it's so unique that someone as powerful and almighty would come and stoop down and bring mercy and compassion. Chris Evans and Chris Pratt, they did the same thing. They'd go to hospitals dressed as Captain America and Star-Lord from the uh, Marvel super, you know, anyway, they do the same thing. Tim Tebow all the time, uh, probably the greatest superhero of all time. Um, Taylor Swift does the same thing, just going in and bringing high. And every single time we see it, we look at it and we marvel because it's so unique that someone of, of esteem and someone of power and might would come down and give mercy and give value and dignity and respect to people that are typically overlooked. And so the psalmist just marvels and he worships. And the reality, church, is this is exactly what God's done for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's why Jesus picks up on this in Matthew 21. It's Palm Sunday. He's just ridden into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And you remember this last week of his life here on earth. And people are waving the, the, the palm branches and Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, remember this? He comes into the temple. He cleans out the temple. And we read in chapter 21, verse 14, the blind and the lame came to hit Jesus in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? And then he goes on and he quotes Psalm 8. He goes, yeah, have you never read the psalm? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you've prepared praise. Pretty arrogant thing to say if it's not true, right? I mean, like the religious leaders are sitting there kind of going, how in the world can you say that? That is blasphemy if it's not true. Meanwhile, everybody around him, they're recognizing that they know exactly what it is that he's saying. He's saying, I am the majestic one who's created the heavens and the earth. Like I'm the one that the psalmist is singing about. I'm the one who's mighty, who stills the enemy through the mouths of babies and infants. I'm the merciful son of man who made himself for a little while lower than the angels to take on our weakness, that the enemy would be stilled through one final act of mercy and might, God taking on flesh and becoming weak on our behalf, that we who are weak may be strong in him. And so the early church, they picked up on this. They grabbed hold of the message, and the crazy thing about it is it didn't make them lazy or entitled. It just didn't. They didn't sit around and be like, all good. Instead, it like made them want to reflect the God whose image they bear. And we read about it in various reports. Roman spies and Roman emperors trying to crush the Christian movement in the early centuries. Second century AD, Roman emperor report, reported on the early church and wrote this about them. They love one another. This is, their, this is the testimony of their gathering. They love one another. They don't neglect widows. Orphans they rescue from those who are cruel to them. If they see a traveling stranger, they bring them under their roof. If they hear that one of them is imprisoned or oppressed by their opponents for the sake of their Christ's name, all of them take care of all of his needs. And if possible, they set him free. They exist in the flesh, but they don't live by the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They love all men, and they're persecuted by all. They are poor, yet they make many people rich. They lack everything, yet they overflow in, it, in nothing. Or, I'm sorry, they lack everything, yet they overflow in everything. And church, this is the reputation of the early believers. And so the gospel just exploded on the scene. As the enemy was stilled through the mouths of relative babies and infants, normal people who were sinful, who were broken, who struggled, who didn't have all the answers to their questions, who had problems, who wrestled with things at home, 
as men, women, and children understood the dignity, the value, the honor that somehow the God who created all that came and conferred to them. They rose up in the confidence of that identity in him. And they carried out the message of hope. And the world has never been the same. The hope this week is that you and I would look at this psalm and that we would enter into a place much like the psalmist does as he looks upon all of creation and he simply just says, God, you who created all of that, you look upon me and you gave me dignity and value. That we would be a people that would leave this place today, that we would walk away, maybe go to bed at night, first thing in the morning, whatever it may be, that we would take a moment and we would worship in light of that reality. The one who spoke and gave all things, put all things into existence, the one who had all power, might, and strength came to us and gave us mercy, gave us compassion, gave us dignity and value. That we would look there and say, God, how in the world is that the case? I don't know. But God, I praise you because it's true. That we would take a moment this week and that we would sit there and that we would worship in light of that reality. And the reality is that some of us walk into the room, and this is a regular, this is a regular thing that we battle with on a, on a daily basis, and you need to be lift up, lifted up. Some of us come in and we struggle with wondering, okay, do I have any value not, now that I'm not able to do the things that I used to do in my prime? I'm not able to make the same amount of money. I'm not able to have the same thought processes. I'm not able to contribute as much as I did in the past and whatever that thing may be that we would come back and say, no, 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 you're an image bearer of God. And the reality is that there's, an, there's, there's a confidence, there's a beauty, there's a dignity that we can stand on in that. And the real, some of us need to come in and just reflect on these truths and just worship in light of that truth. For the rest of us, that we would come and we would look at this psalm and that we would come and say, okay, Father, is there anybody in this world that I've got a hard time giving as much dignity, value, and respect to that you've given to me? That we would come before the Lord and say, okay, Father, would you help me image you just a little bit better? The same dignity, value that you've given to me, God, would you help me with my mouth, with my actions, with my compassion, with my empathy, with whatever it may be? Go and give every single human being, not to the saying that there's never conflict or anything like that, but would you help me give people the same dignity, value, and respect that you've given to me? And then we would say, okay, Father, help me identify where it is that, you know what, I'm just not willing to go over there. You know, it's those people that are really, really difficult. Or it's those people that are really, you know what, they deserve what they get. It's those people, no, 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 God, would you help me to image you just a little bit more? And the truth is, when we come and we pray like this and we ask God to do that kind of work in us, number one, some of us are going to be lifted to the point where we're able to stand once again. Where we're able to stand in confidence and walk with him again and say, okay, you know what? I'm able to let go of the things that I once got dignity and value from, and I'm able to stand confident and secure in what God has done for me, especially in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to be able to go and we're going to be able to give that same dignity and value to the rest of the world, that God will be glorified in our lives. And that's our hope and our prayer for us, that we would go and that we would image him well, all for his praise and all for his glory. God, we love you and we praise you, Jesus. God, that you, you didn't wait for our resume before you gave us value. Father, that no one was left out from what you've given to us, God. Father, I praise you that for one reason or another, you who made all that is saw fit to draw near to us and be in relationship with me. Broken, a baby, an infant, unable to bring anything of true value to you, God. And yet you saw fit to think about me and us. God, may we sit in that. May we worship you because you're worthy of all of our worship. That you would do that for us. Father, that our gathering, that our church would reflect you well. That every man, woman, and child, healthy and not healthy, producing and not producing, 
winning or not winning, rich or poor, educated or not, deserving or not, as we define what's deserving. Father, would we be a people that know how to walk in the complexities of this world that we live in and be able to give people the dignity, value, and respect that you've given to us. God, that you would be praised, that you would be glorified in the end. For the person that's come in today that's having a hard time lifting their head, I pray that you would meet them in that place, that you would lift it. Help us stand on solid, truthful ground. Solid, truthful ground. No room for lies. No room for unnecessary fears. Help us stand on solid, truthful ground. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would lift someone right now. Father, I pray that our hearts would explode with compassion and kindness for humanity, that you would be praised, that people would know the God who's made us in his image. Father, we love you, God. We praise you. We thank you this day in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen.